people to join the forces that are there to be ready to, to fight against what's coming and to learn from each other. So um, this whole, well, yeah, more or less, it was more or less a week that we spent here um, is for me the base to, to prepare something that we will need in the next month and years. So I really hope that we can yeah, join our forces here to prepare something that will help us all in the near future. Um, I think that's all for now. If you have more questions on what happened during the last month in Germany, then I'm happy to answer those. But um, for now, that's all. Okay, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the technology perspective on these things. Uh, I originally built the Tor network for anonymity purposes for people in the US and Europe and civil liberties goals. And then I started getting mail from people in China saying, thanks for the tool, now I can read BBC. And we started getting more and more mail from all sorts of people around the world who were using it not so much for the privacy properties, but for the reachability properties. Now I can get to websites that I wasn't able to get to before. So that's sort of how we fell into the blocking resistance side of things. Mostly when I think of censorship, I think of governments censoring their internet and what sort of tools we can work on that can automate the process of letting people get around that. And another piece of that, so once you have an overlay network like Tor, where you can build paths through the network and pop out somewhere, you can actually start researching this censorship. You can say, I want to build a path through the Tor network and come out in China, and I want to see what Google looks like from China. I want to see whether I can reach BBC today. So this actually lets us learn how the firewalls are working and what's being censored at the time. And then I guess the last point is, uh, to echo what Rob was saying, it's not so much the technology. A lot of this is really a social problem. There are a lot of people in China right now who are saying, I'm so glad my government filters the internet. I'm so glad my government keeps me safe. And while the majority of the people in these countries are thinking that, I can't build a tool that will solve the problem. We need to change the culture so that they stop thinking that, so that they start wondering what else the internet could look like. And, I mean, another example, I was talking to somebody from Thailand three or four years ago, and they sent me mail and said, uh, torproject.org is not reachable for my country anymore. I thought I lived in a democracy. What the heck is going on? I'm going to sue them. And then a year later, the tanks rolled, and we learned that, in fact, maybe they didn't live in a democracy. So in that sense, Tor is an early warning system for which countries are going to be having problems down the road. And, and then the other side of that, uh, we were talking to people in Saudi Arabia. If you're in China, you look around at the people around you and you wonder who's going to inform on you and you try to figure out, uh, should I be willing to, to talk to people about what's going on? Should I be willing to go to this website? If you're in Saudi Arabia, it isn't that there are informers out there somewhere. It's that your family is going to figure out what you did and which websites you went to and that you're posting anti-government stuff you're not so much worried about getting thrown in jail. You're worried that your father is going to beat you for not being an ordinary person. So there are a lot of different cultures that we have to think about at the same time. It's not just a technology problem. We still very much think of censorship the old way, as in there is a book, there's a newspaper, there is a website, and it's been taken off the shelves uh, out of the shops or off the web. And I think it's really much, it's time that we start thinking of censorship in a new way, something that's there and that we're simply no longer able to see because it's being filtered away. It's being blocked from our view. More and more countries are sort of installing all kinds of lists, whether it's a child pornography list, whether it's, as they had in Australia, uh, lists of sites that talked about suicide or about violence or what have you. Uh, in many countries, it's not clear which sites exactly are on that list and on what basis. Um, and one of the things that we found out in, in Europe is that sometimes police officers will put sites on the list um, claiming that only countries are being blocked from which there is no, where you have no legal recourse. Um, for instance, child pornography in all these weird uh, Uzbekistan, Kaz Kazakhstan places. Well, actually, many of the sites that are being blocked are European sites. 
So what they're censoring is not, apart from child pornography, what they're also censoring is people seeing that European police is not doing its work. And nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going on. And at the same time, everybody has indeed this sort of feeling, ah, yeah, but the internet is made nice and safe. There is no child pornography anymore. But the only thing that we're doing is blocking the awareness that it ex exists. We're also blocking the fact that the police aren't doing anything the moment they can. And nobody has any recourse to see whether that's the only thing that's being filtered. Nobody knows which lists are being fed to providers to block. And actually, most of the time, much more is being filtered away than we know uh, and than is being told. So there is a new tool for censorship, and we're not fully aware of how it works and its ramifications. You have to imagine in our governments are many, many old men with black pencils. They don't have any idea what Internet is. They speak about an information society, and this is important to make a government into information society. And this is a mistake, because we don't need and we don't want and we don't have an information society. What we want is a communication society. That means everybody is talking to everybody, not some people, some few people with black pencils speak to everybody else. It's not so one guy can say do this and you all have to do what this one guy with the black pencil say. And they, a little bit they understand that the idea of information society in their heads is not true. They see people are communicating. They see that people come together. They see that people do things and uh, uh, starting politics. And so it's very, very normal that they need censorship. Have I explained it why? You have to say no, no. Thank you. That's the idea. Hi, I've been asked to talk tonight about uh, what it's like to be on the receiving end of massive state censorship. I was recruited to work for MI5, which is the UK Domestic Security Service. Uh, that is usually, or used to be, truncated down to UKSS, uh, but they realised that didn't sound too good, so they changed that in the 1990s. I worked there for six years in the 1990s, where I met my former partner, David Shaler, and we saw so many things going wrong. Uh, including illegal telephone taps, spying on government ministers, innocent people being put in prison, bombs that could and should have been prevented going off on UK streets, up to and including state-sponsored murder. And after six years of this, we decided that this just was not what we'd signed up to do, so we left and we decided to blow the whistle, which meant in the UK going to the press... And then we felt the full force of the state reprisals because the intelligence agencies in the UK have probably the most draconian laws protecting them out of any Western democracy. There is a piece of legislation called the Official Secrets Act which ensures that anyone who's ever worked for the services becomes a criminal even if they report crime on the part of those services. You can never say anything ever to anyone about what you've seen going on there, even if that includes murder. That piece of law, though, also applies to journalists. They can break the law if they report what the whistleblower is saying. So I ended up having to go on the run.